Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming uh, to our last author's night of the summer. My name is Mal Klein. I'm the executive director of Accuracy in Academia. We do these to bring you the authors and speakers you will never get on campus or if you are interning on the Hill, likely before a congressional committee. And I guarantee you that tonight because I'm one of the people making remarks. At any rate, um, all of these events, our Authors' Nights, are brought to you by a grant from the Frank A. Fusco and Noe Galetti Fusco Foundation, which supports our entire conservative university Authors' Nights series, for which we are most grateful. Tonight, we decided to do something different. We're always trying to do something a little different, but tonight, we figured we'd sort of feature ourselves since we just wrote a lot. And we always try to. But uh, we have done not one, between Accuracy and Media, our sister group and us, we have done not one, not two, but three reports on Black Lives Matter and counting. It has been in the news quite a bit lately. And uh, I actually want to start off with a couple of questions. How many of you recognize the names Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray? Now let me try a few others. Montel Jackson, Matthew Gerald, Brad Garofalo. The first three were career criminals, tragically, who died um, resisting arrest. The last three were officers who died in Baton Rouge last weekend. Like it or not, we are all getting our, at least our initial news feed from Black Lives Matter. This is an incredibly influential group. They don't have a big shiny building downtown or anywhere else near the, as we can figure, but they're so much um, more influential than many groups that do. For example, President Obama's favorite think tank, the Center for American Progress, sits over there at 13th and H. It's been around 10 years. I cover it as media. I sit in the press section by myself. They have been trying to change the conversation in America for at least 10 years, mostly in vain. Black Lives Matter is largely writing the script. To give you an idea, just look after the tragedy in Dallas at what the president his Attorney General and Black Lives Matter all had to say. To be fair, those of us of a certain age realize that condolences, try as we might, sound very similar to each other, no matter what we try to do to make them sound different. It's not the consoling part I'm talking about. It's the actual messaging to the Black Lives Matter demonstrators. Bear, me bear, bear with me while I actually read from text here for a second and use my old guy's glasses to do so. OK, look at what they all said. First, on Black Lives Matter website, on the Black Lives Matter website, to assign the actions of one person to an entire movement is dangerous and irresponsible. Here's Loretta Lynch, the Attorney General. Do not be discouraged by those who would use your lawful actions as a cover for their heinous violence. And then there's the President himself at the memorial in Dallas who said of the protest, sometimes they can be hijacked by an irresponsible few. Now, what's what do you see here? They're all 
managing to put some distance between Black Lives Matter and the assassinations. And yet, in the week between Dallas and Baton Rouge, what did we have? We had rallies in New York, Philly, and Ferguson, Missouri, um, in which demonstrators chanted pigs in blankets, fried bacon. How is it at spontaneous demonstrations in different locations they wind up saying the same thing? Yeah. Uh, whether or not you're reluctant to assign cause and effect, you can start to see patterns and it starts to beg the question, what really matters to Black Lives Matter? Going beyond, no one is calling for less than a full investigation of every questionable shooting of a suspect by a cop. I would even argue I'd probably differ with some folks. I don't mind the Justice Department coming in, as they did in Ferguson, and pretty much uh, seconded everything that the DA concluded. But what is it that they're after? What, and what is the messaging? We've gone through this website. I think I've spent more time on the Black Lives Matter website than I have on the Accuracy in Academia website. And Alex, who will be speaking shortly, I know has done the same. Uh, as carefully as we can. And one thing you find is that uh, they devote more space, for example, to Martin, Gray, and Brown than they do, for example, to Eric Garner, a case I still find questionable. Maybe I'm alone, but the grand jury, unlike those other places, produced nothing except a not guilty verdict after a questionable video where the cop was apparently strangling the guy, or appeared to be. And what was his crime? Selling loose cigarettes on the streets of New York. Full disclosure, I found myself doing this myself one time. I didn't plan it the way, I was just smoking and somebody offered me a dollar for one, so I says, okay. But <laughs> at any rate, the other thing is they weren't as active in the protests, which were relatively peaceful in New York after the Garner verdict, compared to further reason to question that one is that the city was willing to give his widow five million in a wrongful death suit. But then in Ferguson and Baltimore, which just got leveled uh, almost, but when you, is there a link? Is there a link? It's, it's a really good question because uh, the person you see most frequently in the news, um, on cable network news, D. Ray McK McKeeson. Uh, how many times did you proofread me on this, Meekin? At any rate, D. Ray McKeeson. And last year, he taught a course. We still don't know if it was for a semester or a Saturday. It's unclear the time frame. But as part of the course he taught at Yale, he had a reading entitled, In Defense of Looting. Now, the title of this is kind of self-explanatory, but I'm, bear with me again while I quote a little bit from it, because again, we're trying to trace the roots here. And we're not done. We're still researching this and welcome any and all information we can get Listen to this, the reading he's talking about in defense of looting. Looting is extremely dangerous to the rich and mostly white people 
because it reveals with an immediacy that has to be moralized away that the idea of private property is just that, an idea, a tenuous and contingent structure of consent backed up by the lethal force of the state. When rioters take territory and loot, they are revealing precisely how, in a space without cops, property relations can be destroyed and things can be had for free. Well, some of us would have a problem with that if we merely took seriously the commandment, thou shalt not steal. But it's even worse. Because the writer is wrong. It doesn't just affect white people. It affects all people. Quote from a lady whose business was leveled in Ferguson. Delina Jones. She said, I'm an African American. I'm a single parent. I have two kids. I'm affected by this. It's almost a little contradictory with the chance of Black Lives Matter, but it seems that only some Black Lives Matter. This is her, not me. The thing about it is, when you look at what the founders, whom our child prodigy intern is going to tell you more about. No, they're, they're right there if you want to. I know. It's all you. Okay. At any rate, uh, are saying you find that they deride what they call black capitalism. The rest of us might just call it making a living. But this derision of capitalism is one constant with them. Some might call it a free market. In fact, between riots, they are not though they may appear to be dormant. For example, they have had 1,300 plus protest actions in the past 729 days. That's what, about two a day? They came out with a statement after the, get to say the word tragic all too frequently these days, terrorist attack on a gay nightclub in Orlando, which they said had nothing to do with terrorism and blamed on capitalism. I think, I would hope you'd uh, check out our reports. We will, of course, be available for questions afterwards Call, call out either one of us, or uh, maybe I'll just pass the tough ones on to Alex. I don't know. I don't, I'm kidding. Um, but um, the three reports are sitting right over yonder, and you're welcome to grab one. There's also, what is the uh, URL for the new website? We actually have a Black Lives Matter it's exposed. It's blacklivesmatterexposed.com. I was going to guess that. Okay. <laughs> I should. I'm on it. At any rate, uh, check out our material there. And as our friends on CNN like to say, we thought we'd just start the conversation. <laughs> and I thank you for coming. And now I hand it over to a young man who joined us this summer who passed on a lot of these things to me. He's still an undergraduate, but quite a good researcher and writer and reporter. Alex Nitzberg. Alex, knock him dead. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, Black Lives Matter is a radical social intervention. And no, that is not the comment of a commentator, a conservative commentator. That is a direct quote from their own website. Uh, the movement was founded by three women named Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, and Patrice Colors. And all three of these women are feminists and community organizers. So in case you're <coughs> not familiar with community organization, I want to explain a little bit what that is because it's really important to the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Um, 
So Saul Alinsky wrote a book called Rules for Radicals, and he is really one of the key figures in the development of community organization. I'm going to read you some quotes out of his book. Um, the first quote, this is a quote, the organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt, ex uh, overt expression. That's one quote. In another place in the book he says, when those prominent in the status quo turn and label you an agitator, they are completely correct for that is in one word your function, to agitate to the point of conflict. Okay, that's what a community organizer does. They agitate to the point of conflict. And all three of the women who founded Black Lives Matter identify themselves openly as community organizers. So two of the three women, Garza and Kalors, they also identify themselves as queer. And that's really important, actually, because the Black Lives Matter movement has a very heavily promoted LGBTQ agenda that almost no one knows about. I see you making a face over there. If you've never heard about this, thank the media, because the media doesn't report on it. I watch Fox News avidly, and I really don't think I've heard anything or hardly anything about it, even on there. So the media mostly, I mean, there's, there's some reporting on it. We've done reporting on it, and other people <laughs> have. But largely, their LGBTQ agenda goes underreported. Um, so for instance, I'm going to read you. Th these are quotes directly from BlackLivesMatter.com. Quote, we are committed to disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another and especially our children to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. So on their website it says they want to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement. Another quote, one of their, one of their what they call guiding principles on their website says that they're transgender affirming and that, that, this is a quote from their, trans, their, their, their guiding principle says, quote, we are committed to doing, and there's a little ellipsis here, I skipped a little tiny thing, but you can look it up, I mean, it didn't change the meaning at all. We are committed to doing the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folks, meaning transgender. And so this focus of promoting the LGBTQ agenda is a really, it's really important to the founders. If you read what the founders say, they really, they talk about this. They say it's really important to us to include queer and transgender people in our movement. It's really important to them. It's all over the website, but I mean, I didn't hear about it until I started researching the website. So uh, another interesting thing is the founders have a, and the movement, the movement and the people that found it, they have a real disdain for capitalism, which Mao already mentioned. Uh, so <laughs> let's see here. Um, in the aftermath of the Orlando attack, he mentioned that they, they released a statement. And the statement says, the enemy is now and has always been the four threats of white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and militarism. These forces, and not Islam, create terrorism. So right there, they, they, they say that the terrorist attack is caused by white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and militarism. And then in my research, I wrote a profile of Alicia Garza and another profile of Opal Tometi, two of the three founders. And Alicia Garza was speaking in 2015 at something called the Left Forum. And she said, quote, it's not possible for a world to emerge where black lives matter if it's under capitalism. And it's not possible to abolish capitalism without a struggle against national oppression and gender oppression. So, so right there, you can see the, the combination of their LGBTQ agenda and their hatred of capitalism just in that one quote. And then last Tuesday, so literally like a week ago, uh, Opal Tometi, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, was addressing the United Nations. And she said, I would argue that the international community faces three core challenges to advancing human rights. Those are global capitalism, white supremacy, and the suppression of democracy. So it's very obvious that these people, they, I mean, they, they'll say they, they don't like capitalism. Um, they'll tell you, you just have to research it. But the media, the media really focuses on only one aspect of the movement and they ignore a lot of the other things that the movement is about. Um, I interviewed Colonel Allen West and Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark about what they think about Black Lives Matter. And so I just wanted to read you some of the things that they said. Um, both of these men are black Americans, so I wanted to, and they're, they're prominent, they're on the media, I wanted to know what they thought. Um, and so Colonel West, he actually wrote an article, and in his article, he described Black Lives Matter protesters as useful idiots, hearkening back to Vladimir Lenin's phrase. And he said that, that they were nothing more than progressive socialist pawn in an insidious game of distracting the black community from the failures of progressive socialism and its horrific adverse effects. And Sheriff Clark also said something similar. 
Uh, when I interviewed him, he said, quote, these are nothing more than riot makers and they stook up bitterness and resentment in people and they use the police as a distraction from the staggering failure of liberal politicians in these large urban areas where these ghettos are contained. So it's interesting because both these men basically agreed with each other that it's a leftist movement that's, that's trying to uh, kind of cover up um, some of the negative consequences of liberal policies. And what I found really interesting is that Sheriff Clark's statement where he said they're nothing more than riot makers that stoke up bitterness and resentment in people. Well, what is that? That's, that's exactly what, what Saul Alinsky taught. He taught that people need to agitate to the point of conflict. So it all ties together. And accuracy in academia and accuracy in media will continue to report all of this information about Black Lives Matter, even while the majority of the media ignores it. So visit blacklivesmatterexposed.com. We're still writing new articles. We have a lot of research on there already. Thank you. Hey, with your best shot. Go ahead. Can you discuss the influence of Islam within Black Lives Matter? Not just in the origi its, its original statement, but how it's evolved since then. You know, That's one of the things we're still researching. Yeah, we haven't really gotten into that even yet. So I've heard stuff about that. Like, I don't know if there is an influence. I don't know. Do you know? It's a bit vague, but it looks like parallel lines. But looks can be deceiving. Yeah, so we can't really say because we don't know yet. Good question, and that's another thing we're still trying to track. One thing that uh, James Simpson did in our January special report for accuracy in media is to trace some of these roots. Every time you look at a left-wing group, you're looking at tentacles, you know? And part of the way they get their funding, they don't really have a capital plant, but is by organizations that all the people he was just mentioning have started, which in turn feeds into Black Lives Matter activities. And then they in turn start their own. So yeah, we're still tracing that web. I gave tentative answers to two questions. Sorry. I have a question which may be tinged in irony, but are any of these organizations registered as 501c3? <laughs> And do they, I mean, do they file at all? But if they do file, is there anything useful in, uh, in their IRS filing? Actually, that would, I think that would go to the groups connected with the founders, because that's how Jim Simpson did a lot of his tracking of them, was through the 990s filed by the groups that were started by the founders of it. Yeah, if you look, like we have some profiles of some of the people. Actually, I think, yeah, we have profiles of two of the three women that founded it up right now. And they work at organizations separate from, like Black Lives Matter is kind of decentralized. It's not really like, a, like an organization. I don't think they, I don't even know if they have like, do they have a bank account? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, so I don't, I'm Facebook not sure. Facebook meetups and Twitter. Yeah, I don't know the answer to your question, but you, you probably would have to do what he said and look into the organizations they work for. Yeah. Check out Jim Simpson's report. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I have a question for um, um. Okay, So you said it was um, Black Lives Matter was a leftist movement to distract from the bad liberal policies. Um, can you give me a couple examples? Or like well, those are actually, I was reading quotes from Alan West and Sheriff David Clark. So those are not my words. Um. So you would, have to, you would have to check with them on that because <laughs> I was just reading what they said there. But actually, if you want to see those articles, I mean, obviously, they said a lot more than that. Like, I wrote three articles about my interview with Sheriff Clark, and they're on, they're on um, accuracy in academia. And some of them are on, I think two out of the three are on, are on blacklivesmatterexposed.com. And the Alan West article is on blacklivesmatterexposed.com. Mm -hmm. 
if you will permit me a mini tangent, the <laughs> Shouldn't say that to me. Uh, no. The hard left has been using and abusing the civil rights movement for at least three quarters of a century. You can go right back to the Scottsboro boys. God bless them. Um, the Scottsboro boys legal defense fund none of which apparently actually made it to their actual legal defense. And you can fill in the blank on what they will use. And going off into another mini tangent, this is their latest project. Uh, since most of you, I think, are in your early 20s, you might be too old to remember their last one. Occupy the Occupy movement. They occupied Wall Street, Washington, D.C., the state of Washington, and Walmart. Twinkle up, twinkle down, that's how they expressed approval or disapproval, open mic, tense. But that kind of faded into, ex that kind of faded out around the time Black Lives Matter started. And if you, Look at a lot of left-wing groups. Uh, you find that they feed into each other this way. But I encourage you at the Daily Caller to do that. Yeah, and if you, I mean, did it's you want me to like saying. give you an answer? Because I can, I could answer for them. I mean, it was a quote from them. But like one of the things Alan West uh, was saying in his one of his articles was the thing about he thinks that the people in Black Lives Matter are useful idiots being used by the left. So. I mean, I'm, you'd have to ask them directly what they mean, but I'm thinking they're probably saying the people in these movements are not like, hey, we're going to go cover up liberal policies. The people in the movement really believe in what they're, whatever they're, <coughs> they think they're doing, and then the people that are higher up maybe have ulterior motives. That would be my guess. Like, uh, I remember Sheriff Clark said something in the interview about um, these movements being used to enrage and excite people. So the people being enraged and excited, they're not like masterminds, you know, they're not, they're, they, they really think they're doing something, and maybe the people higher up, you know, think that have a bigger plan for it or something. So, okay. another question: Is there any evidence that the Black Lives Matter protesters get paid? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't run across it yet, but where they get funded is another question we're looking. At. I can tell you this, since we do try to get to as many of their get-togethers as possible, it is astounding how the left can fill up a room any time, day or night. You know, uh, we actually draw as our, the base of our audience, you know, conservatives with day jobs. So. We have to work around that. Yeah, it's, it's also interesting that so many times they're all carrying the same professionally printed right. font. Right. Yeah. Saying the, the same thing. Right. Right. Well, the when Occupy Wall Street was occupying the student plaza, yeah. um, why don't you tell them about the um, experience that uh, Jennings and his other people on our staff when they went over there to uh, Oh! They got the uh, jobs Post. Supposedly, this is another big thing with these left-wing front groups, and God knows we've been tracking them for a long time. Their stated mission is rarely their real one. And with the occupiers, I'm so glad you reminded me, their stated mission was jobs, real jobs. So three of our young and idealistic staffers actually rounded up a bunch of job applications 
took them down to Occupy Washington at Freedom Plaza and tried to distribute them and were turned away, told to get out. They were bothering people. They, took, they picked them up from Target and places like yeah. that. Yeah. They were genuine. You know, they were actually, yeah. They were real, and yeah, but they wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. Hey, Mal, can, let, me, let me read this from the, because uh, what Don was asking about, the funding and stuff like that. So I'm looking at their website, and it's, it's pretty hard to try to figure out because, you know, they're talking about, you know, that you can donate, but you donate to the local chapter. And then you try to drill down, and you're still trying. You're still kind of nebulous as to what's going on here. But there's 56 of those. Yeah, I thought this. I thought this was interesting from the site. Um, you know, it says before you contact the Black Lives Matter chapter, please note that Black Lives Matter is a network predicated on Black self determination, and BLM chapters reserve the right to limit participation based on this principle. Please be aware that BLM chapters have varying membership policies and may or may not uh, be accepting new members at this time. Also note that membership requirements may vary by, uh, vary by chapter. Lastly, expect some delay in response to your inquiry. Finally, <laughs> parent, in the parenthesis, he said, we exercise the right to ban any IP address we find sending harassing content. And actually, when you go through, when you go through the site, you know, you, you, various quotes pop up from time to time, Huey Newton, all these different things. So this thing, this site is just interspersed with all kinds of <coughs> radicalism going back at least. Are these, are these, oh, sorry. Maybe this will be a good time to mention the dedication in Saul Alinsky's book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the dedication of Saul Alinsky's book, I think there's three actually, but the last one it says he wants to give an over-the-shoulder over acknowledgement to Lucifer. And <laughs> he says the reason I think is be something along the lines of because he was the first radical or first something that to win his own kingdom. But the way he talks, I don't even think Saul Alinsky, I don't think he was really like a biblical guy. I don't think he really believed <laughs> that. But, but it's very creepy. I mean, it's right there in the introduction. In, 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 <laughs> David Horowitz, Marxist turned conservative author, activist, pointed out, it's so ironic, he, we live for irony, uh, that at least one thing Satan and the left have in common is that they keep changing their names. <laughs> I have a, just a comment related to what was, Don was pointing out. Are, are these membership organizations? Are any of them, I presume, some of them you get a card that says you're a member of Black Lives Matter. They haven't admitted us yet. Well, and, that, and the, the next, and I'm stuck in a world of legalism having worked for the U.S. government for 33 years. <laughs> uh, if you have a membership organization which is race-based or which is exclusionary on the basis of race, then you're supposed to be able to, to kiss your 501c3 status, your nonprofit status, goodbye. Do you want to answer yeah. that? I'm not sure they're registered. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, all yeah, exactly. It's, it's that web that you were talking about. Exactly. You can't really tell. You, go, you cannot tell where these guys are coming from. You need to do some deep investigation. Because Jim got 990s from every group but Black Lives Matter. But they all led back there because the same founders were on the boards of all of them. Yeah, I don't. I don't think most, I mean, I was surprised when I heard um, somebody was just reading, it may sound like, I didn't think they had like entrance like to the club. I thought it was just a loose kind of thing. Like, I don't, have you ever heard anything about them like having, a, like you have to sign up for a club or like, is there, do you know about that at all? I don't, yeah, I'm not really sure. I didn't think there was like something, but I didn't. We've not run across it yet. I haven't really researched like the chapters and how they work and stuff, so, yeah. Well, I, I, it may have been a misinterpretation of, of what was written there, but the idea that you can exclude people from your organization on whatever basis we decide uh, suggested that some of, at least some of these Black Lives Matter organizations do have membership roles and do have exclusionary mm. uh, rules in terms of, of who can join and who can't. Does Obama know that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be concerned. I think, um, 
happens to be black was, um, as a black woman, do you consider racism to have gotten better or worse since President Obama has come in? She said, I think it's gotten worse. And she was asked why. And she didn't really have a good answer as to why. And I don't think that anyone wants to point fingers. And I think, well, I don't think that she wanted to point fingers. And I think that it doesn't really help to point fingers. If you have any idea as to why, like, do you believe that racism has gotten better or worse since since our, our current president got in office, and if, if yes. Because, worse, and because we've strayed, we, we were striving since Martin Luther King for being judged on the content of our character rather than the color of our skin. Obama started bringing back the color of our skin, rather than the content of our character. One thing you can check too, I just did this follow-up. Is the uh, see how many Wall times Wall he references and race. The Wall Street Journal just did a poll of Chuck Todd just mentioned it on Sunday that uh, they done a study on race relations, and it's the worst they've been in 25 years. Wow. And, you know, and now Chuck Todd is not the kind of guy who's going to blame Obama. But there's obviously, you know, you look at this and you say, how can this be? Now, neither candidate, you know, Clinton nor Trump stood out you know, one of the, the, out of the survey respondents, 41% uh, you know, said that they would, you know, they would believe more, you know, Hillary, uh, you know, and 19% for, for, you know, for Trump. But 33% of them didn't think either candidate was going to be good on this issue at all. So, I mean, you know, this is a big problem. I mean, this, this problem has just grown larger now. Particularly, you know, I think you know this poll coming. I don't know exactly when. I didn't look back to see exactly when the poll was conducted, but it was <coughs> obviously before Baton Rouge, maybe even just before Dallas. But you can see the trend going this way. But you, you can just look at some of the statistics in that study. It's pretty phenomenal. Also, one of the things that you find looking internationally, looking at, at places other than the United States, is that when you have times of economic difficulty, race relations anywhere. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't go down this road, but I can't resist. <laughs> that is the pretend economy. I'll repeat it when you get back, OK? I'm not. The pretend economy. Here's something I ran across quite by accident. You can check it out. The Bureau of Labor Statistics. I wanted to compare because you, you only hear about new jobs without hearing about jobs lost. You've got to have both to get any idea of what the net is, how many we really have. Same with the place jobs come from, new businesses. Uh, You've got to look at new businesses versus bankruptcies. I found much to my surprise that the Bureau of Labor Statistics has done this. They actually have something called the new business survival rate. Check this out. From 2000 to 2016, the new business survival rate went from 48% to 20. One in two to one in five. So if you seem to be seeing a lot of going out of business signs, it's not your imagination. Sort of said, it's okay with us. 
were behind you. And so I don't think you can separate that scenario from the mindset of the American public, and probably more among, probably more the younger you go in age. He was so more he was more conciliatory in those days. Well, he was more conciliatory before he got elected the first time. Well, because he had to get elected. Yeah. Maybe. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be around for a little while. I want to say, once again, uh, we'll be starting these up in, again in the fall. We'll have this up on YouTube. Minus my hand gestures. And all of these evenings are brought to us, again, by a grant from the Frank A. Fusco and Nellie Goetti Fusco Foundation, which supports our entire conservative university lecture series, for which we are most grateful. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good night.